So we're going to spend time this morning as we gather to worship, reflecting on God's incredible grace and forgiveness to us. And in the book of Exodus, we see how the Lord, when, when he declares who he is to Moses, leads with this attribute of himself. This is what the Lord declares as he passes by Moses. The Lord passes before him and proclaims, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Our God is holy. He is righteous. He is just. He is pure. But he is a God of steadfast love, a God of mercy and a God of grace, a God who has forgiven us through sending his son Jesus Christ to die for our sin. And yet Jesus rose from the grave victorious over our sin and evil and death. And that's why we gather to celebrate and worship. So I want to invite you to stand. And let's spend time just marveling at this God who is so full of grace and mercy. We just invite the Holy Spirit to open our eyes this morning to who God is, and He's the source of all that is good and all that is beautiful and all that is true. So would you invite Him to, to do His work this morning? Come thou fount. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise And teach me some melodious song and Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it Mount to thy redeeming love. Yes, Lord. I raise. And here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I come. And I hope by thy good plan safely to arrive at home. And Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed His precious blood. Sing of his grace. And oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh. Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Let that be your prayer. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, 
Seal it for thy courts above. Well, one day, Jesus' disciples, they ask him to teach them to pray. And in his response that we call the Lord's Prayer, we have received one of the greatest gifts imaginable, a vision of what it means to commune with our Heavenly Father. And so far, far from this simple formula for just kind of getting what we want, the Lord's Prayer, it shows us this, this full-orbed, this multicolored, life-encompassing way to interact with the God of the universe. And so to borrow some perspective from the late theologian J.I. Packard, in biblical prayer, we learn to approach God in adoration and trust, acknowledging both his work and his worth. In biblical prayer, we admit our sin and we seek his pardon. We ask that our needs be met both for ourselves and for others. We accept from God our situation as he has shaped it. And we cling to him in faithfulness through thick and thin. And so this is biblical prayer. And the Lord's Prayer, it embodies all of that in this very concise sentence. And so I want to invite you to, to join us in this prayer from Matthew chapter 6. But before we do, could we just put that on the, on the screen? And I just want to invite us just to pause for a moment and just meditate, read these words, deliberately slowing down as we prepare to approach our Father in, in this prayer. Together, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let's continue to let that message sink in as we sing this song that's been based on the Lord's Prayer. Heavenly Father, you always amaze me. Let your kingdom come in my world and in my life. You give me the food I need to live through the day. And forgive me as I forgive the people that wrong me. Lead me far from temptation. Deliver me from the evil one. The kingdom of the heavens is now advancing. Invade my heart, invade this broken town. Yes, Father. The kingdom of the heavens is buried treasure. Would you sell yourself to buy the one that you found? So why should I worry? Why am I filled with doubt? God knows what I need. You know what I need. Your love is, your love is, your love is strong. Your love is, your love is, 
Your love is strong. Amen. The kingdom of the heavens is now advancing. And nothing can stop it. Invade my heart. Invade this broken town. Amen. The kingdom of the heavens is buried treasure. Would you sell yourself to buy the one that you found? And two things you told me that you are strong and you love me. Yes. Oh, yes, you love me. Your love is, your love is, your love is strong. Your love is, your love is, your love is strong. Your love is, your love is, your love is. Strong, your love is, your love is, your love is strong. Our God in heaven, hallowed be thy name above all names. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us weary sinners and keep us far from our vices and deliver us from these prisons. I sing of his love. Your love is, your love is, your love is strong. Your love is, your love is, your love is strong. What can wash away my sin?
this is all my hope and peace nothing but the blood of Jesus this is all my righteousness nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious Amen. Amen. Well, church, why do we sing about blood? Right? Maybe that seems kind of strange to you. But listen, I think it's really important that we don't just sing these songs mindlessly. We don't just sing these words mindlessly, but that we, we pause and that we remember the magnitude of what Jesus' blood shed on the cross accomplished for us. And so if you just allow me a moment, just in light of that song we just sang to to share the gospel with you this morning. The Bible says that in our rebellion against a perfect and a holy God, it incurred a debt that could only be paid through the shedding of blood, either our blood or that of a substitute. And while animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, they, they temporarily covered sin, they could never, they could never permanently remove it. And so when Jesus, the Lamb of God, when he offered up his life in place, in our place on the cross, as the perfect sacrifice, a new world of possibility opened up for you and for me. You see, by his blood, we have been redeemed. We have been set free from sin and its power. It's like, pay, like paying a ransom to free someone from captivity. We were slaves to sin. Ephesians 1 says that Christ's blood paid for our redemption. But not only that, his blood also brings forgiveness of sin. It restores the broken relationship between us and God. Colossians 1 tells us that in Christ, God reconciles people to himself, making peace by the blood of his cross. And here's what's even more amazing, church is that not only is something taken away from us, not only is our guilt taken away, but Romans 5 says that his blood justifies us, which means it, as believers, we are declared righteous in God's sight. So like a, like a judge who declares someone innocent in court, we have been given the perfect record of Jesus placed on us. And that is amazing news. And none of that would be possible were it not for the blood of Christ shed on your behalf. So church, praise Jesus for the blood, for his blood that he shed for us. That's why we can sing, oh precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. No other fountain I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen? I want to continue worshiping. Reminder, we don't just worship when we sing, but in every element of the service is an act of worship offered to the Lord. And so we're going to take a moment to greet one another, turn and greet each other with the same warm welcome that we have received from the Father. Before we do that, I want to remind you that we have Bibles in the back underneath the exit sign. And so please go grab one if you forgot a Bible, or if you don't have a Bible, just take it as our gift to you. And if you are a kid, five to nine years old, you can... Head out now to First City Kids. Your teachers are waiting for you. Take a few moments to greet one another. So good to see you all. That's always the uh, part of leading liturgy that's never fun is breaking up good conversation. Uh, but it is good to see you all. For those of you who are new to First City, my name's Chris, and I serve as a lead pastor here. We are so glad that you've decided to join us for worship this morning, and I hope already 
you've experienced uh, some grace and hospitality because that is our heart for you, is that you would know the grace of Jesus Christ and that we would love to extend hospitality to you. So if you have questions about First City, uh, ways that you would like to get connected uh, further into the life of the church, a couple things that you can do. One, if you like to talk to people, and we have a lot of friendly people here at First City, uh, there is a welcome table right outside this door where you can stop by. Uh, we have a, a gold connect card that you can fill out. Just get a little bit of information from you to, to be able to follow up. Or feel free to hop on uh, Church Center. That is our online communication uh, app where you, you can find out all that's kind of going on uh, in the life of First City Church. And in particular, if, if you want to get connected and learn more about who we are as a church, kind of see what it's like at the ground level, We'd love to connect you to uh, one of our gospel communities. This is one of our small groups. Uh, they gather throughout the week, get together uh, to eat, uh, spend time kind of reflecting on God's word and praying together. And so it's a wonderful opportunity to meet more people and kind of see, hey, this is what it means to be part of First City Church. And so if you'd like to get connected, uh, please let us know. And listen, that goes for whether you're someone who's uh, confident in your faith, you're looking for a church home, want to get connected to uh, the life of a group of believers and be on mission or maybe you're someone who's unsure of what you believe, but you'd like to get connected to a church community as you're wrestling those things out. Listen, you're more than welcome here at First City. And even if you wouldn't say you have faith at all, but yet you're exploring, you have questions, you'd like to just meet people who do have faith, you're welcome. You are most welcome here. And so no matter where you are in your faith journey, uh, please let us know if we can connect you uh, further into the life of the church. Now, I have two announcements for us this morning before we transition to our time of prayer. The first is a reminder that next Sunday is a fifth Sunday, and fifth Sundays are uh, an opportunity that we take uh, to invite the kids into the service for the entirety of the service. And so we will only have First City kids for ages one and two, so just a reminder. Uh, but it's a, it's a fun, lively morning uh, where we get to celebrate as, as one church family, and we do this every time there's a fifth Sunday of a month. So just as far as preparation for next week, uh, a reminder there. Second announcement for the men in the room. Men's Bible study is kicking off in about a month, and so registration is now live. And we're going to be studying the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel is this incredible story of God's faithfulness in the midst of opposition and suffering, but also this incredible story of what it looks like to stand strong in faith, to be confident in the Lord's power in the midst of opposition and suffering. So there's a lot of really great things to dive into in the book of Daniel. Also, the back half of Daniel is apocalyptic literature. And so if you've been with us, you know we're in the book of Revelation. And so if you want to study apocalyptic literature a little bit more, help you understand some things about the book of Revelation even better, because as we're going to see, Revelation borrows a lot from Daniel. And so if you want to just understand and deep, dive deeper into the book of Revelation, jump into Daniel. And so men, this will be an incredible time together to grow in our study of God's word, grow as men together. Uh, so please sign up. You can stop by the welcome table to do that. My friends James and Thomas will be out there. Wonderful recruiters. They will recruit you. They will talk it up. You will be raring to go if you talk with them. Grab one of these cards. Has more information. There will also be a sign up uh, in the weekly update uh, coming out tomorrow. There will be options for Sunday evening, Monday evening, and Tuesday morning for those studies. And also, men, the ladies have like 70-some women signed up for theirs. So not to make it a competition, but just saying. <laughs> well, as we transition into our time of prayer this morning, uh, there, there's, th this week has uh, reminded me and, and really made me grateful in some of the ways that, that myself and we as a church are, are connected to the broader church. Uh, so this past week, I, I spent uh, a, a few days down in Wichita, Kansas, uh, helping assess church planters for Acts 29, and it's just fun to be a part of, of the lives of these men and their wives as they discern God's call in their life. And then this morning, we have my friend Eric Tonjes, who's going to be preaching uh, God's word. Eric is the pastor of Grace Central uh, in Omaha, and over the past year, uh, he and his wife Leah have become dear friends of Mindy and I, and so uh, we're, I'm excited to have him come and open God's word. Eric is a good pastor, a good teacher. You're going to enjoy hearing from him. And so, Eric, thank you for being here, uh, sacrificing time away. Leah, thanks for jumping in. I know being away from your church is sometimes kind of a challenge, um, especially when you're the lead pastor. And so it's great to have you guys and your family here. So i um, excited for that as well. And then also, uh, specifically for our time of prayer, uh, we are excited to be able to update you on the trip that Eric Goodell and I took a couple weeks ago to Nepal. 
Uh, and so with the beginning of this year, we entered into a partnership with an organization called Church in Hard Places. And what Church in Hard Places does is they train uh, pastors and church planters in areas of the country that, that are under-resourced. And so they, they provide uh, funding, they provide training and resources so that these pastors can be trained in good gospel-centered ministry, as well as equipped and encouraged in, in the hard work that they're doing. And so the money that we give to Church in Hard Places goes directly to this cohort that started in Nepal. So everything that we give goes right to these men to, be, to help them be trained and developed. And at the end of August, Eric and I got to go over and visit uh, this cohort, they, they just started this year, uh, and so they're, I'm kind of moving through the first year of this cohort, and uh, got, a, got a message from uh, the, the cohort leader, Narayan, who you'll hear from in just a second, uh, just that they, they gathered this weekend again to get together and just encourage one another and do some training. And, and our trip, it's hard to kind of condense down what we experienced in that trip, but it was an incredible experience. Uh, if you think of you know, how you hope a trip goes and how it ends up going, like those things aligned. It was such a, such a gift, and I know many of you were praying for us, so thank you, God answered your prayers. And so rather than hear me talk about this, uh, Eric put together a video that will kind of give you an idea of what our trip included. I see a hand wave. Yep. There's an issue right now with the screen. Okay, so I'm going to keep talking. So let me, let me just share one thing since, since I had the space. I wasn't necessarily going to do that, but since I got a delay here a little bit. Uh, I want to I share one thing that, if I can kind of be vulnerable here. Uh, so one of the things that admittedly I was a little self-conscious of, is so, so we went over there and I got to do some training. And I was a bit self-conscious. Here comes the white guy from the United States going over to Nepal and training these pastors. And would there just be kind of this weird sense of, you know, white savior kind of thing? It was not my heart. Church in Hard Places really tries not to, to have that posture. I mean, the pastors, the cohort leaders, they're all um, from that country. And so there very much is this sense of like, hey, we're partners, we're brothers, we're not coming in here to be the experts. And so went in there, had the opportunity to meet these brothers, a uh, few of their wives, got to do training, spend a number of days with them. And, and this was what was so cool. And it really didn't hit me until I got back. That felt no different than being in a room of American pastors, like, there was no difference in the sense of camaraderie and connection and teaching. The only difference was I was a pastor who had a few more years' experience. So it was me sharing, hey, guys, I planted a church. Here's some things I learned. Here's some things I want to encourage you. They could have been white. They could have been black. They could have been uh, Nepali. It didn't matter. We were brothers in Christ. We were fellow pastors, co-laborers. And that was the work of the Spirit. And that, that was such a cool experience to just say, man, you're my brother. I want to encourage you. I want, I want to make new friends clear across the world. So... It was really cool to see what the Spirit did and to get to experience that. Are we good yet? We are good. Awesome. All right. So let's, uh, let's uh, take a look at this video. officially leaving the United States of America. On the and number one rated airline in the world. That's right, and here's why. The socks. <laughs>
I'm here with uh, my new friend Narayan and brother in Christ, and we are in the back of a taxi. We've got Chris up there uh, getting the whole experience. <laughs> this is Kathmandu traffic. It's like nothing you will see in the United States. It's, uh, it's, it's almost the frontier. <laughs> culture is just just has so much color and vibrancy yeah. and just life it's it's been really fun I've got a family, my wife, and uh, three kids. Uh, we have been ministering in Kathmandu, uh, and uh, we planted this church in 2016. Uh, and then you're also involved in uh, Church in Hard Places. Yes, I've been overseeing a cohort uh, where uh, new church planters have been trained in the gospel. We, we, we are grateful for this ministry because it has given us a great platform to prepare uh, men of God for His service. I, I, I love being uh, with those brothers. I love those brothers because they have a gene, they have uh, a desire to serve the Lord, and they have a desire to grow. has been a real uh, great week for me. Uh, the reason being uh, meeting some great new friends and spending time talking about the gospel, about the church, about church planting and uh, this has been so lovely so far. opportunity to travel to a different part of the world and see how the gospel is advancing in, in Nepal, in Kathmandu in particular. And so be praying for, for our continued relationship with them. Be praying uh, for these pastors. These, these are men who are young in ministry. Uh, they're, they're just kind of learning what it means to be pastors, what it learns what it to mean to proclaim the gospel in, in a nation that is uh, technically hostile to the gospel and, and it is against the law to, to proselytize and to convert. It's not as hostile as some places, but there is still opposition that they are facing. Uh, and so these are men that are planting churches, sharing the gospel in that context. And really, as, as Narayan pointed out, these brothers, they don't just love Jesus, they love each other. There's like no sense of competition. They're just encouraging one another. So it really is a beautiful movement of God that he is doing in the church overall, but also in these emerging leaders. And so we want to pray for them. Uh, we're going to be sending out more uh, like interviews with some of these guys for you to get to know them and just ways you can be praying for uh, the church in Nepal and these pastors. And so in light of all that, thank you for letting us to give an update. Uh, let's, let's pray this morning as a church. Father, I thank you for just your goodness uh, to us in being able to be connected to the broader church, to be able to see that your kingdom is greater than what is just happening in Bellevue or in Nebraska or in the United States, but all over the world, your church is advancing, your gospel is going forward, and there are brothers and there are sisters who care deeply about others coming to know Christ, about healthy churches being planted, about a proclamation of the gospel that is clear and is biblical, about being healthy leaders themselves, healthy men who love their wives and families and, and wives who support their husbands and, and build churches that are healthy, that, that, that are growing spiritually. 
Thank you, Father, for uh, the work that Church in Our Places is doing and just the ways that they are um, giving particular focus to places in the world that are under-resourced and that need encouragement, need the kind of resources that we often take for granted here uh, in the United States. And so thank you uh, that we can be part of that. And so, Father, we want to pray in particular uh, for this cohort of men uh, that are meeting in Kathmandu, that are growing together, that are uh, being developed as as leaders, as uh, pastors, as men of God. Uh, Thank you for uh, Pastor Narayan and his leadership of this cohort and the way that he loves and serves uh, the other pastors and their families. And so we want to pray for Narayan. Would you give him strength? Would you give him wisdom as he is uh, having to, to lead a lot of things right now? Um, so would you uh, help him uh, to, to be wise with his time, wise with uh, the, the other men that he is trying to raise up in leadership? Um, pray for other pastors like Hamant and Surendra and Santos and Hari and Nabaraj and Isai. Thank you for the ministry that you have given them and are giving them. Uh, I pray, Father, for protection for those men, protection over their families, uh, protection from those that would do them harm. Would you bless them, bless their churches, would there be great joy in those churches, and would the gospel go forward through those men and their churches. Uh, Pray also, Father, for uh, Narayan's church as they are are dedicating their their new building uh, next week and just the joy that that is. Uh, Would you continue to bless that church? And then also just, Father, for... Just the, the, the great work you're doing in the church in Nepal, just pray for its health. Um, in so many ways, it, it's still growing. There's still the sense that it, it's, it's small and, and fledgling. Uh, God, would you deepen the roots? Would you strengthen it? Would the church of Jesus Christ be powerful in Nepal? Would it push back the darkness of false religion and false promises? Would, would the, the light of Jesus Christ save many? rescuing and redeeming and renewing and set free those who are in prison to sin, in prison to lies, in prison to the the false religion that is so prominent there. God, would you move in this country in a powerful way so that that, that we can see that and rejoice in you. And Father, would we be faithful uh, to continue to pray for them in the days and weeks to come. Uh, We pray that this relationship would deepen um, and we can be a, a true Uh, encouragement to those believers in Nepal. Thank you again, Father, for this opportunity. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with me if you're able for the reading of God's word. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payments to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a 100 denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw that he had taken what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then the master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of the Lord.
Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction. You guys are indeed dear to us as well. My name's Eric. I got to check. I'm doing a stand, and I don't think Chris does the front row. I'm not blocking you off here. All right, we're good. Um, yeah, I pastor Grace Central Church, PCA Church in the middle of Omaha, and it is an honor to be with you here. I will just say, uh, I know you guys have started preaching through Revelation, and I assume that the reason I didn't get asked to cover the next sermon in that series is because you're still in the easy part of Revelation, and if I was here in a month that um, I might have to do like the, the beast from the sea and the land or something, but um, we have been preaching through Matthew, and so I'm just going to jump into a sermon that I preached recently at Grace from Matthew chapter 18. But with that said, I'm going to pray for us, and then let's turn to God's word. Father, I pray now that you would be with me and with us as we seek to engage with your word. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable to you, O God, my rock and redeemer. Amen. So this passage in Matthew, relatively famous passage, is about forgiveness and forgiveness is one of those topics that's interesting to talk about because it is at the same time one of the most beautiful and controversial and difficult and essential parts of Christianity. It's one of the most beautiful parts of Jesus' teaching in lots of ways. There are stories we run into in the world about forgiveness that make the news and go viral because it's so touching to people. And on a more personal level, some of the most beautiful moments that I've experienced in relationship with people are when I have experienced that forgiveness when I failed. It is at the same time, especially in our cultural moment, controversial. Some of you are probably more aware of this than others, but there are a lot of people that wrestle with the idea of forgiveness, feel like it is letting evildoers off or undermining justice or enabling oppression. So it's controversial, and some of that arises, I think, also from the fact that it is deeply difficult. While we might recognize its beauty, I certainly struggle at times to forgive. It is easy to say, and it is incredibly hard to work, especially at the level of our hearts. But while all of that is true, it is nonetheless essential. It is something we pray for every week in the Lord's Prayer, as we were reminded earlier in our worship service. It is something that is deeply necessary for our relationships. I know on some ultimate way that without forgiveness, like it would be impossible for me to move forward in relationship with people. So it is all of those things, and that, I think, is why Jesus talks a lot about it in the Gospels and why he focuses on it this morning. So we're just going to dive into our text. First, we're going to do some preliminary stuff before we get into the story, but our text starts with this question where it says, then Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I have to forgive him? As many as seven times. And it's worth asking why he asked this question, because we can tend to chunk up the Gospels, but this is in a flow of narrative in Matthew, and the context is actually important. So just before this, in Matthew chapter 18, is actually where Jesus discusses specifically these questions surrounding what happens when there's issues and conflicts in the church, and he ends up talking about this process that people go through, that we end up today kind of referring to as the process of church discipline, where if your brother sins against you, which is exactly the same language that Peter uses here, so it's clear that he's asking about this thing, right? When your brother sins against you, right, first you go to him one-on-one -on -one and talk about it, and then you bring some people as witnesses, and then it would ultimately be brought before the whole church. And typically, when we think about that passage, when I preached on that passage, what we focus on in our culture is that that's hard, right? That we struggle with the idea of consequences, that, you know, the, the tensions that we feel around that. But Peter focuses on another thing. He hears all of that, and what he notices is he's like, but wait a minute, what you're saying is that at any point in that process, right, if this guy who sinned against me turns and repents, then I have to forgive him. And so he says, well, I want to know what the limits of that are. And we're going to dive into that more in a minute, but I just want to note that context is actually important because of some of the things in our modern world that we wrestle with when we talk about the ideas of forgiveness. Uh, one of the, the accusations or tensions that people have with Jesus is this idea that if you embrace his teachings about forgiveness, that that somehow does things like enable abuse or allow injustice to go on. And that, that context should make clear to us that what Jesus is about to talk about here in forgiveness is a real and hard calling, but that it's not opposed to a proper biblical sense of justice and those other issues. And for that to make sense, again, before we dive in more in Matthew, let me just try to 
lay out what we're talking about here. One of the challenges, I think, is that in English, when we talk about forgiving people and forgiveness, we're really talking about a few related ideas that exist in the Bible. So, there's really three things that that covers. First of all, sometimes when we talk about forgiveness, we're talking about the biblical idea of simply overlooking a fault or a sin. The Apostle Paul tells us that blessed is he who overlooks a multitude of faults. And that is to say, for all of us in all of our lives, there are all sorts of little things that people do to us that are annoying or hurtful or wrong that we are called simply to dismiss and that don't really get into any of this stuff that Jesus is talking about here, right? When that guy cuts you off in traffic, like that's not a like start the Matthew 18, go to your brother, right? That's simply a overlook a multitude of faults because there are many things, small little things that we do wrong in life together and those things can hurt and be annoying and frustrating. We overlook those. That's one way we use forgiveness. That's true. But then there's a second way we use it. That way is saying, okay, there's also these more serious things that happen. And in those cases still, part of forgiveness is also releasing your right to vengeance and hatred in the face of those things. That's also a biblical idea, right? Paul, Paul tells the Roman church that vengeance belongs only to God and that we have to give up our right um, to seek vengeance for ourselves. And so we talk about that in terms of forgiveness. And that's also something that is a biblical calling. But then the third thing that we talk about is this idea of reconciliation and moving when a relationship is broken by sin back into restored relationship. And we use the word forgiveness for that too, and that is also a true and biblical calling. But unlike those first two callings, Scripture does see that as something that requires repentance in order to have happen. That's what that Matthew 18 process Jesus talks about is about, and he's assuming in what he discusses here in that kind of restored relationship forgiveness that there is a sort of repentance that's happening that leads to that re relationship. And repentance meaning not just saying like, oh, I'm sorry, but, you know, really um, owning and grieving and bearing fruit of repentance. Um, let me just say one thing about that because we wrestle, well, two things about that. Let me, I'll say two things. First of all, while that third thing is more complicated and requires that kind of repentance and work to restore relationship, um, even in those situations where that's not true, the first two things are still true, right? We are still called particularly not to seek vengeance kind of unilaterally. But on the other hand, it is also true biblically that that third thing is something that... Um, Look, I think one of the, the tensions we can have in this discussion, when we overlook that need for repentance, right, that leads to that kind of restored relationship, is that we're actually demanding that people be more forgiving than God. Like, God does not treat us as our sins deserve. He's incredibly merciful to us. But for us to experience restored relationship with God comes with a calling for repenting and turning from our sin into him. So all of that said, that's just kind of setting that context. Jesus lays that out. But within that framework, then, Peter comes to Jesus and says, okay, given all of that, though, my brother is repentant, he wants restored relationship, how often do I have to forgive him? Again, we see that in verse 21, and then um, he says, as many as seven times, and Jesus says to Peter, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. So Peter says first, well, how many chances does he get? Like once, okay, twice, but, but how many times can this happen and I still have to forgive my brother? And he says seven. He throws that out as a number. And that's probably Peter actually trying to be really gracious. It, it seems in his day that some rabbis had discussed this question and said it was something like three times. Sort of it's three strikes and you're out. And Peter gets that Jesus is saying something about forgiveness more radical than the world that he's in. So he's like, okay, how about seven times? I mean, you know, like if baseball games had seven strikes, right? Like they'd go on forever and the scores would be ridiculous. He says, how about seven times? And then Jesus responds and says, no, not seven, but 77. Or maybe growing up, if you know the King James, you heard 70 times seven. And the Greek could be rendered either way. But it probably is 77 because what Jesus is doing here is actually referring back to this kind of obscure moment in the Old Testament. So there's this moment. Uh, if you know the early chapters of Genesis, you have Adam and Eve, and then you have Cain and Abel, and Cain murders Abel. And then from the line of Cain, you have these descendants that lead to this guy named Lamech. Lamech is known for a couple of things in the Old Testament, uh, including the first person to practice polygamy. And he's meant to stand in as kind of this symbol of the spread of the curse. But there's this boast of Lamech in Genesis 4 that we get, where he says, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77-fold. 
And so I don't think Peter's thinking about that when he says seven times. But Jesus hears that and thinks about that story. And he says, this is actually a good illustration, right? So you have Lamech here. There, that, this is, that's kind of like this hip-hop guy boasting, right? Like, oh, yeah, like you get seven times, I'm 77 times. And Jesus is saying, no, Peter, actually that attitude, that intensity about seeking vengeance in contrast to that, that's what I'm asking you to do about forgiveness. Not even seven times, but 77 times, which also should show us he's not using therefore that number in a literal, like, you got a little notebook and you keep track, and on time 78, you're like, okay, finally, I don't have to forgive anymore. But he's saying in that same kind of boastful, over-the-top over way that, that, that we see vengeance and revenge spreading in the curse, I'm calling you to forgive. So Jesus gives that calling, that 77 times radical forgiveness calling, and then he knows that Peter's going to struggle with that. He knows that all of us are going to struggle with that. And so that's where he then shifts and tells a parable, tells a story to help us in our struggle. And that's what we're going to then focus on for the rest of this morning. He tells this story, and the story basically comes in three acts. And so we're going to walk through each act. The first act is about the king's mercy. We see the king's mercy. So as we heard the story read... There's this king who settles accounts with his servants. And when we hear this, just for the record, probably what we're supposed to have in our mind is not that this king's calling in like his butler and his maid and settling accounts with them. Generally, they wouldn't owe a king money and certainly not the kind of money we're going to get to in a minute. Probably by servants, he's talking about like the king's vassals, like the people that rule over provinces of his kingdom. But we have this king who's settling accounts with them and he calls in one of his servants and this servant, we're told, owes the king 10,000 talents. And let me do some translation because that should make you raise your eyebrows. So in the ancient world, one denarius was sort of the basic unit of money. There were smaller units of money, and you'll read sometimes in the Gospels about a denarius, but one denarius is a day's wages. So I don't know what a day's wages is for you, but like 100, 200, 300 bucks, however you want to think about that in our world, right? Um, one talent, which was a much bigger sum of money, was 6,000 denarii, so 6,000 day's wages. And so this guy owes 10,000 talents, which is to, to say billions of dollars in modern terms. Like, this is an unimaginable debt. In fact, we have records and whole Roman provinces wouldn't pay in taxes 10,000 talents for one, of, for one of the times of their taxation. So this is, when Jesus states it, an impossible number, right? It's not just, oh, this is like this guy owes some money. This guy owes more money than he could ever dream of paying back. And the king, when he can't pay it back, orders the family sold into slavery. That's probably not to recoup his losses. You're not going to sell these guys for, you know, maybe even one or two talents. But rather, this is probably actually the king enacting a sort of justice. One of the subtexts of this story is probably that the first servant's kind of a shady dude. You don't end up owing the king 10,000 talents, billions of dollars, if you're an above-board responsible ruler. But he's going to sell him into slavery, and the servant begs the king and says, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Notice now, what the servant's doing, he's saying, I'll, I'll pay it back, which is probably impossible. But what the king does then, it says, is he has pity on him. He has compassion on him. It's, he's moved in his innards, is what the, the Greek kind of says. And, um, and so he forgives the debt of this servant, and the king, therefore, loses out on these billions of dollars. And he, note, he doesn't say, okay, yes, you can pay me off. He simply cancels the debt. So that's the first act. We see the king's mercy. And where that meets us when we think about forgiveness is laying the framework, which is to remind us that our forgiveness, whatever we say about it, is a pale reflection of God's unimaginable forgiveness of us. The king in this story is clearly meant to stand in for God, and the servant is meant to stand in for each of us. We are in relationship to God, all servants who owe him everything. In the first place, even more than this guy, right? Every, every breath that we breathe, the fact that our eyes opened this morning, the sun, or in this case, the, the cooler air and the blessedness of that, uh, and the food you ate for breakfast, and, and gathering here. Like every moment, everything in all of creation is God's. All of it is gifted. We owe him for all of that. And even worse than the servants in this story, what we do is not just take that and be ungrateful, but in our sin, we rebel against God. We actually declare war on heaven. So we're like not even this kind of servant, but you know, this rebel vassal that's declared war on the king. And nonetheless, what God does in Jesus 
is to pay our debt. What he does in Jesus is to accept the loss for himself. We mentioned this already, but it's important to recognize in this story, when the king cancels the debt, that is another way of saying that he pays the debt himself, right? If, this, if he's out billions of dollars and this guy's never going to repay him those billions of dollars, then he is willingly paying that cost instead. And of course, ultimately, that's what Jesus is about in the gospel, that Jesus is offering himself to pay the debt that we owe and could never pay. That we, like that servant, are simply in a place where we have to say, Lord, have mercy on us, and that God works in Jesus to cancel the debt that he owes us and forgive us. That is our king's great mercy. So we see that mercy, and then we kind of shift into act two of our story, and we see the servant's hardness, the servant's hardness in response to that uh, mercy. I'm going to read this section, uh, starting in verse 28. It says, but when the same servant went out, He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pled with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Now, Jesus intentionally is using very similar language here to tell this second act to kind of echo the first act. We have a lot of things that are the same, right? We have another indebted servant who's also not able to pay, and he gives in exactly the same words, the same plea for mercy. But of course, Jesus is doing that to show us the contrast. In the first place, this is a story about a fellow servant. This isn't a king and his vassal. This is this one servant going out and finding another one. In the second place, the amount of the debt is much less. Now, if you remember our earlier translations, 100 denarii is still a lot of money. In modern terms, that's like, tens of thousands of dollars, right? It's a debt that conceivably the servant could certainly pay, but this isn't like the guy, you know, bought covered lunch and then expects to be paid back. This is a real amount of money, but a much smaller amount than the first servant owed, a a monumentally smaller amount. And of course, then the ultimate contrast coming out of that is the first servant's response, that he does not show compassion the way that his master has just shown it to him, but instead, he has the second servant thrown in prison. And we're supposed to, at that point, see that and just think, that is crazy. That's absurd. Like, that, this guy's terrible. Why would he do that? The reason, of course, that Jesus is highlighting that is because he's trying to remind, remind us of that reality when it comes to ourselves. That our struggle to forgive Even though, to me, when I'm struggling to do it, it feels totally righteous and justified and vindicated, when we view it from heaven's perspective is equally absurd. Look, before we even get to God and the gospel, it's just worth noting, even on a human level, I depend on forgiveness all of the time to function in the world. Like, as a a husband, which my wife Leah can attest, as a pastor, as a parent, as a friend, um, I need people to forgive me because I regularly sin and fail. Uh, I mean, in, in little ways and sometimes in bigger ways. I, I hurt people. I can be selfish. I can uh, be uncaring towards them. I can fail to have the heart that God calls me to have towards them. Like, I regularly depend on forgiveness. And even on a human level, we should look at ourselves when we are being unforgiven and recognize some of the hypocrisy of that. I mean, I, I, I absolutely do that, right? I've had those moments of conviction where I'm just fuming mad at somebody because they've done something to me, and then the Holy Spirit in his kindness is like, dude, like, you do the same thing. <laughs> Don't you recognize that you've done the same thing? Yesterday, you did the same thing, and you were forgiven. How can you be unforgiving? And while that is apparent even on the human level, of course, that is much clearer when we consider the mercy of God. The foundation of our life with God is his forgiveness shown to us. The foundation of my ability to be in relationship with God is that he paid for my much greater sins against him with the price of the life of Jesus Christ in order that I could be reconciled to him and forgiven. And so it is absurd, in some ways even more absurd than for the servant, for me to then refuse to show forgiveness to others. Shakespeare Um, in his play, The Merchant of Venice, which the whole play is kind of about law and grace as this theme. He has this very memorable and famous speech at the end. I'll just read you part of it, but this is Portia speaking at the trial. She says, says, though justice be thy plea, consider this, 
that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. Which is a way of saying, look, you come in and you say, I want justice. But consider that in a universe of justice, none of us would see salvation. <laughs> that, that we beg God, we pray, we rely on God's mercy constantly. And so that should teach us to show that same mercy to others. So God's forgiveness that we see that King's great mercy demands that same mercy and forgiveness of us. So that's two acts, and then one more, we see the King's justice in response to the servant's unforgiveness. The other servants are scandalized at the first servant's hard heart, and so they go and tell the King. And in verse 32, we see the King respond. It says, Then his master summoned him, and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Now, I'm going to take this off of us a little bit in a minute. But I just want you first to feel this is an intentionally hard saying by Jesus. Uh, the, the ESV translates it gen, jailers, but really the, the, the word is torturers, um, right? He's giving him over to be tortured, which was not a thing in Israelite law, but was absolutely a thing in the Roman Empire. Um, and he's given him over to be tortured until uh, all the debts are paid, which, as we said earlier, given the parameters, even if this guy wasn't in prison being tortured, he'd never be able to pay it off. So when that is, is never I mean, Jesus is using language that probably is meant to evoke the language of the kind of endless torment of eternal punishment. Um, and in fact, in other places too, he uses that to highlight the magnitude of unforgiveness. Um, he says it at the end of this passage in verse 35. He says, also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And in Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, similarly, he says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, again, hold on in just a minute to speak to that fear. But this is about as serious as Jesus gets in the Gospels. He's saying our failure to forgive is an eternally dangerous, serious thing that we need to wrestle with. But let's talk about why that is. And so first I want to name what that doesn't mean for us. Um, I think some of us, especially if you're someone who has a more tender heart or wrestles more with guilt a lot, hears those warnings of Jesus and it's like, oh no, like I, I'm done. Like, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure there were points in the past that, that I failed to like be as forgiving as I should be. And so like, am I in danger of the fires of hell in the face of that? And the answer to that is no. Uh, that's not what Jesus is really talking about here. And in the first place, look, that kind of thinking can make something like forgiveness just end up being a new law, right? And if the message is that God cancels all of our sins, he pays for them in the cross, he forgives them all of the debt of our sin, then that includes failures to forgive. So he's not making this new law where if you ever fail to be as forgiving as you should be, then you're going to lose God's grace or something. But Jesus is focusing on a willful refusal to forgive. It is one thing for us to wrestle to forgive or at times to fail to be as forgiving as we should be, but it is another thing to simply say, I'm not going to do it right, in the face of, um, of that. When, when we see repentance, God calls us to seek reconciliation, and we just say, nope, I'm out. That kind of hardened, willful refusal to forgive, Jesus is saying, is dangerous. But why is it dangerous? Why is that something that Jesus has such strong words for? I think the answer is that what that often betrays about our hearts is that we haven't really internalized or received for ourselves the greatness of God's mercy and forgiveness for us. That an unforgiving heart is one that has not appreciated or experienced or internalized for ourselves the incredible reality of the king's mercy that we talked about a little bit earlier. Here's a good way, I think, to think about that. It's worth asking this. Why in the world does the servant go out to the second servant and treat him this way? Right? Have you wondered about that? Like, like it's easy to just think, oh, this guy's dumb. But, but why is he functioning that way? I mean, there's a couple of possibilities. Maybe it's that he simply hasn't internalized the reality of the king's grace to him. It may well be that this servant is like, 
well, you're saying this, but I think I'm still going to have to pay you off. And so what he's doing is then he's like, well, i got to get all the money I can to get ready for that. And so he goes and he sees this guy that owes him 100 denarii, and he tries to extract it, right? Maybe it's that, that wicked servant has failed to internalize the reality that the king has forgiven him. Or maybe he's internalized it, but he sort of decided, like, but that's because I deserved it. Like, I'm such a good servant, even though somehow he's billions of dollars in debt. Like, I'm such a good servant that the king's doing this to me, but he's doing that in a way that then breeds his self that self-righteousness where he looks at this other servant and he's like, but you're not like me, and so you deserve to be punished. Like, we don't know. Jesus doesn't tell us exactly what's going on, but what's clear is that the first servant has failed from his heart to really receive and experience the glory of the mercy that the king has just shown him. And that's ultimately the thing that keeps his heart from showing that forgiveness. The root issue for us when we struggle with unforgiveness is often that we haven't fully internalized the reality of God's grace and mercy to us. That is part of why Jesus sees it as so dangerous, because that failure can very easily be the sort of hardening of unbelief, right? If we, haven't, if we don't have hearts, hearts that have really, in repentance and faith, received God's grace, then that is a spiritually dangerous thing. But I think it's also deeply helpful for us because it tells us that the way that we then grow in the kind of forgiveness that God is calling us to isn't through kind of gritting our teeth and trying to force ourselves to do it, but the way that you grow in this kind of forgiveness when it's hard, and it will at times be hard, the way you grow in it is by more fully experiencing and internalizing the grace of God. I, um, in my younger years, was deeply formed by the Puritans, who I know have a reputation at times for being kind of dour and harsh, and that's not always undeserved, but they're also deeply appreciative of God's grace. And one of the things that I learned from them and still think about a lot is what they called experiential religion, which is they said that as a Christian, you do not know any idea of theology or scripture until you have actually known it experientially. Here's how the best Puritan, John Owen, I'm sorry if that's a wrong opinion, Chris, but um, uh, he puts it like this. He says, Experience is the food of all grace, which it grows and thrives upon. Every taste that faith obtains of divine love and grace, or how gracious the Lord is, adds to its measure and stature the experience of the reality, excellency, power, and efficacy of the things that are believed is an effectual means of increasing faith and love. So that uses some kind of older words, but what he's saying, he's saying basically God's grace, God's love are meant to be taken by you like food, that that's the way that you are supposed to experience them. I love, I like to cook, I love, I love food, but he's saying like, look, the thing about food is that if you think you know about it, because you're like, I can tell you how this was prepared, and I can tell you how many calories and macronutrients it has, and I can like explain the Maillard reaction that causes browning on the outside of the meat. Like You can do all that, but until you've tasted the food, you don't know the food. You don't really know anything about it. And, and Owen is saying there, Scripture tells us that the same thing is true of the grace and love of God. One of the failings of many Christians, I think, is that we know the facts about God's grace and love and forgiveness, and so we think we know it. <laughs> we, we can talk about it. We can, we can state the, the categories and things. But the reality of God's grace is that we haven't known it until we have really tasted and experienced it for ourselves. And as we do that, then that will work itself out in the forgiveness that we're called to show other people. But the more that we have savored the taste of God's grace to us, the more that we have experienced the incredible mercy that he has shown us in our failures and sins and the ways that we have fallen short, the more that we experience that, the more we will be able to and even compelled to show forgiveness to others. And so the answer to our struggles at times to forgive is to constantly soak our hearts in the grace of God. So how do we do that? Let me just briefly give you a spiritual and a practical answer. Spiritually, ultimately, the only way you're going to truly experience that for yourself is to open your heart to God, ask the Holy Spirit to give it to you, right? That, that grace, that experience of grace has to be a gift. And so do that. Pray for that and seek that. But practically, there are spaces in our lives where we can experience that. Um, and let me... Let me Here's what I mean. Let me give you an example, and this is a moment where I'm not sure quite how you do it here, but I'm going to talk about how we do it at Grace. Um, one of the things we do every week in worship 
is that we um, have a time where we confess our sins to God. And then after that, um, someone from Scripture declares to us the good news that we're forgiven. And the thing about that time and the way that we do it is I think it's easy for us at least. Do you, do you have a declaration of forgiveness? After? Okay, we're good then. Um, and I think you have the Lord's Supper afterwards, which is even better for tasting it. But here's the thing. I think it's easy for us to focus on that as like, the point of that is the confession, right? They like name all the sins and feel really bad, and then we're like, okay, that's done. And we almost kind of skip the second half of that. But historically, in the way that that was engaged with, the point of that time was actually what comes after the confession, when we hear from Scripture that our sins have been forgiven by God. Because what's supposed to happen is like, yeah, you feel the weight of that, and you're reflecting on your failure, and then you hear God in his perfect word declare, you are forgiven, right? You get to come to the table and see embodied in the elements the reality of Jesus' broken body and bloodshed for your forgiveness. And in that moment, you're supposed to say, like, taste that, right? Suck that in, drink that up, because that is, that's what's true, right? You, you look for that space, and then you don't just do that, right, when you come together on worship on Sunday, but you actually make that the habit of repentance and confession in your heart. That, that one of the things that I seek to do, I sit with God, and, you know, and, and I spend that time in prayer, um, in rhythms of prayer, usually it's kind of in the evening for me when I'm just reflecting on my day and working through, like, Lord, like these are ways that I've sinned. These are failings that I've had. Um, but you don't just name those things and move on from them. <laughs> like, like the key thing you do is you name those things and, you, and then you say, you hear God and his spirit declare it and those things are forgiven. Those things are covered in Jesus' blood. You don't bear them anymore. You make that daily habit of recognizing your sin and then eating and tasting the mercy of God for those specific things and failings and you let that start to work its way into your heart and you claim the reality of that, that you are forgiven and your sins have been covered. As you do that, as you start to really taste of the king's mercy, that will start to soften our hearts. That will start to work in us. The kind of forgiveness that Jesus is talking about here. The kind of forgiveness that can say, I forgive, I release my rights on these things, I can even move towards reconciliation because I follow a God who in unimaginable ways has done that for me. Let me pray for us. Father, that is a hard calling and a glorious truth that you give us in your word. I know it is a hard calling. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, you, I know in my own heart, Lord, it is a process that I am in at times, seeking to forgive others. It is um, a weighty thing and a thing that I just don't want to do at times. Lord, I pray that you, by your spirit, would work in my heart, and in the hearts of each of us here, that we would be people who would grow in the supernatural power and grace that it takes to show that forgiveness to others. And most of all, our Lord, I pray that you would work that in us by helping us to more and more apprehend the glorious trait, truth that you have forgiven us. Thank you for your grace that you've shown us in Jesus, Lord. Thank you that as we repent and believe in him, you forgive all of the debts that we have owed. You have paid for them in his cross. You apply that to our hearts by your spirit. And I pray that you would help us to experience that and know that and so be people that forgive. I pray this all in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Just as Eric said, <clears throat> now we get to experience. Now we get to taste. So I want to invite you just to take a moment here to be still before the Lord and consider where are those places in your heart that you're holding unforgiveness, you're being unforgiving? Where are those places in your heart where you need to experience the grace of God for yourself, that forgiveness, so that you can then forgive others? I'm sure there are ways the Lord has been bringing conviction Maybe just right now, or maybe you need to ask, but let's just spend some time before the Lord, and as he brings those things to your heart, confess them and experience his forgiveness.
And just as we practice confession personally before the Lord, we also practice confession together as a church. We recognize sin doesn't just affect us individually, it affects us as a community. And so we practice corporate confession each Sunday so we would be shaped in the gospel together. And so this morning, uh, we're going to confess how we can be bitter and unforgiving. The words will be on the screen. Let's confess together. Our Father in heaven, we confess bitter and unforgiving hearts. You have been gracious toward us, yet we resent your grace toward others. You have forgiven us, yet we fail to forgive others. Forgive our resentment and free us from the prison of bitterness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Fill our hearts with your grace that we would willingly give grace and forgiveness to others. Well, brothers and sisters, in light of our confession of sin, hear the good news from Colossians. And you who were dead in your trespasses, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. For you who are in Christ, you have been made alive and Jesus has nailed your sin to his cross. You are forgiven. Rest in these promises and be at peace. We get to celebrate the goodness and grace of God to us this morning by receiving the Lord's Supper. And so if you are a baptized follower of Jesus, we invite you to come and celebrate this great forgiveness that we've experienced in Christ. If you're here this morning and you don't profess faith in Jesus, one, I hope what you've heard this morning has stirred some questions. And I'd encourage you to take what you've heard this morning and do something. Don't just let the moment pass, but whether it be uh, myself or one of our other pastors or someone in this church that you know, I'd encourage you to go and just wrestle through your objections. What is it that keeps you from faith? And also, this is a a meal of faith for us, and so I think we'd agree for you to come forward would be to do something that's in your heart, but it's not in your heart and and with your your actions, and I I think we'd agree you wouldn't want to do that. But follow through with what you've heard this morning and and wrestle through. And also this morning, if you're here and you're you're a professing believer and you've yet to be baptized, like we would love to talk to you about what that means so we can welcome you to this table and celebrate with you. And also if you're here this morning and, and you're walking in unrepentant sin, in such a way for you to come forward would be to, to take it in, in kind of a flippant and unworthy manner. I'd invite you maybe this morning you should just hold back from that and hold back from coming forward, but don't stay there. Talk with me, talk with Pastor Paul, talk with someone in the church, like work through that to experience God's forgiveness so you can walk out repentance, so you can come forward and take this meal with a heart that, that honors and reveres what Christ has done. But for those that you're professing faith, those that will come forward this morning, what God's word tells us on the night he's betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. And so church, so that we could experience the grace and forgiveness of God, the body of Jesus given for us. And likewise, he took a cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, the blood of Jesus that has been shed so that we could be forgiven, so that we could experience God's abundant grace. And so come this morning and experience that grace. As Eric said, take it in as literal food and be encouraged and be strengthened in that great forgiveness to you. The logistics for how we do communion will be on the screen behind me. Please come when you're ready.
Sing, I surrender. Oh, all to Jesus, I surrender all. To Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. Jesus, I surrender humbly at His feet. I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. Take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender.
make this your prayer of consecration. Oh, all to Jesus I surrender, Lord. I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Your love. Empower, let your blessing fall on me. Oh, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. Oh, the joy of full salvation. And oh, the joy of full salvation. Sin and death defeated. Glory to His name. Yes, amen. And oh, the joy of full salvation, sin and death defeated, glory to so much for serving us this morning. It's good to be with you all. As you go, go with this blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace.